Hello everybody, and welcome back to some more live coding. I hope you are all excited for the Selenium browser automation that we're going to do. So if you're not familiar with Selenium, it's basically a tool for doing web browser automation. And here's their website, seleniumhq.org. So, they say, what is Selenium? Selenium automates your browsers. That's it. What you do with it is up to you. So yeah, typically it's used for testing, for testing web applications, but I have found use for it when scraping web pages and taking screenshots of web pages and otherwise just automating the browser. And some of the things that makes Selenium pretty cool is that it actually uses the real browser. It actually uses Firefox or Chrome or whatever and you can actually, I'll show you, we'll go through it, but you can basically have the browser up and click around on pages and then run a Python script that drives the Selenium thing and does some clicks in your browser and then you can go back to clicking it yourself and looking around so it's pretty cool and the alternatives are so I'm not sure of any other alternatives that actually drive the browser itself except for one browser extensions browser extensions themselves can control the browser but you can't use that from Python or something like that so the other option is something like Phantom JS but the difference between Phantom JS is that it basically fakes being a browser and running JavaScript and generating a DOM and everything. Where, yes, yeah, so it uses Cute WebKit as the backend. And Selenium actually uses Firefox or Chrome or something like that to actually drive. So that's really the major difference. So I've got an agenda of kind of what I'm going to go through and look at just so you get an idea of what we're going to. Hey, Dark Coder. Coder says, hey. So the goal is to, yeah, kind of get get used to the basics and see what it can do. So we're going to install a web driver, and I'm going to use Python, but they have bindings for Java and Ruby and JavaScript and all the other good ones. But I'm probably going to use Python. And we're going to demonstrate how to use it to pull up a page, how to take a screenshot of a page, how to use it in headless mode, meaning where you don't actually see the browser, and in visible mode where you can actually look around and interact with it yourself. We're going to look at how to do things like clicking and how to extract links, and so that'll give us a pretty broad overview. And anything else that we come across and we explore in the meantime. So let's see, which part of Selenium is appropriate for me? So. I know that we're particularly interested in the web driver. And that's a web driver is basically the language binding to the driver of Firefox or Chrome or whatever. So Selenium takes care of the actual API calls to the browsers and using the browser's native automation exposure. And Selenium then provides you the bindings in Python or whatever to drive it. So yeah, the Selenium web driver, if you want to create robust browser-based regression automation suites and tests, or scale and distribute scripts across many environments, or scraping, uh, taking screenshots, stuff like that that I mentioned. The Selenium IDE, I'm actually not familiar with. That's if you want to create quick bug reproduction scripts, create scripts to aid in automation-aided exploratory testing. <clears throat> then you want Selenium IDE, a Chrome and Firefox based add-on that will do simple record and playback of interactions. Okay, so this sounds a lot like, I've never used this one, but it sounds a lot like iMacros. And this is another really useful one in the browser. And I'll just mention it here. Oh yeah, I don't know if there still is a free version or what, but it used to be free and it might still be, but it looks like it might be a paid thing now. 
but it was a browser extension where you could basically record and script actions in like a domain specific language for the browser. But anyway, Selenium IDE looks like it kind of does the same thing. It lets you record, yeah, record your tasks and see what they are and kind of re-script them. So I'm not going to look into that except maybe, maybe later if we have some time. But I'm going to focus on this web driver. A collection of language specific bindings to drive a browser. The way it is meant to be driven, yeah. Okay. Okay, so let's go to documentation and skim through this. We got introduction, testing, introduction, how about Selenium web driver? There we go. Introducing web driver. How does it drive compared to Selenium RC web driver and Selenium server? What else? Okay, maybe introducing web driver. Maybe I'll check out that page. Web driver advanced usage. Browser startup manipulation. I'll skip that. And the rest looks like miscellaneous. Okay, so there's not much there about installation. So let me go to downloads. Below is where you can find the latest releases of all Selenium components. Here we go. Driver language bindings. Python. Download from Pippi. Okay, so we can, since it's on Pippi, we can just install it, yeah, with pip. So let's do this. Let's open a new... Okay, I already have a, a virtual environment. So I'll activate it. Um, I don't have Selenium yet, so we're gonna see an install here. Okay, well, I guess that was it. We're done. That was fast. Docs. <clears throat> Supported Py yeah, uh, 2.7 and 3.4 plus. Pip install Selenium, drivers, yeah, so it looks like they've got a Chrome, an Edge, a Firefox, and a Safari driver. I'm gonna try the Firefox one. Selenium requires a driver to interface with the chosen browser. Firefox, for example, requires Gecko driver, which needs to be installed before the below examples can be run. Make sure it's in your path. Failure to observe this will give you a missing Gecko driver error message. Okay, and it gives us a little example we can run there. So let's try running it, but I'm gonna try what is it? It's B Python. So if you've never seen B Python, I think that's what it is. B Python, yeah. So maybe you've seen I Python, which is a better, a better Python interpreter. There's also B Python, and there's B Python Erwid. Erwid is like an N curses library, but B Python is like a better I Python, and the B Python Erwid is like an even better version of that. So I'm going to use that for now. Just for this little whatever example it is. So they say from Selenium and you can see the autocomplete and stuff you get at the bottom. That's why it's awesome. Web driver. Alright. Browser equals webdriver.firefox. Okay. There we go. No gecko driver. So let's open a new one and go check out how we install this gecko driver gecko driver releases version 0 24.0 and I guess we gotta download the files we'll do Linux 64 tar we'll download that to the downloads folder and let's see, it's a tar gzip, so we say xzf strap zip file gecko driver. Oh, uh, where did it? LSATR. Did it even extract anything? Verbose? Let's do a verbose. Oh, it's literally just one executable. 
I was expecting some kind of library or something. So let me move that gecko driver into my home home bin. I should have that in my path. I can do an environment and grep my path just to make sure. And I want to say grep bin. Oh, there's a bunch of bins in there. Um, let me do this Z RCL just to make sure. I'll go ahead and do this. Delete to the end of the line and add just to make sure it's in my path. Okay, now it's there. I'm gonna have to re reload this shell here though get to get it in my path. So let me activate the virtual environment again. And then I'm going to try out the code again. Okay, so we should have it Yeah, in the history. I'll just reload it. All right, now it's loading, boom. And you see it actually fires up Firefox. And luckily it was able to find Firefox in a default path. If you have trouble, then sometimes you have to specify the executable path inside the constructor for the object. But you see, it actually started up Firefox. It's, it's, it's an actual Firefox that it's going to drive, and you watch it. You can watch it drive it around on your screen. It's so cool. <laughs> so let's try this. Browser.get. And let's try and get devdungeon.com. And now you can see it's actually fetching the page in the browser. And you can see if I... It's not making it bigger, but there's a little robot icon and the, the URL bar is orange. And this high, when you mouse over it, it says browser is under remote control. So you can still interact with it yourself. Like you can move around. It's a totally normal browser in that sense. So you can go around and then tell like, okay, on this page, let's go do something and you can see we've got the autocomplete here so we can kind of browse through the functions that are available here browser.back browser add cookie browser binary that's the actual firefox executable so if we print that it should actually just output i thought it would output the uh, name of the yeah it's a none yeah, maybe it's it's empty and it's using a default one, that's why, because we didn't specify one, so. And then close, we could close it if we wanted to, but I don't want to close it. Context, current URL. Okay, cool, we can check out the current URL. Create web element. So we can add things to it. Interesting. Close. Delete all cookies, delete a cookie, execute a script, execute async script. What happens if we do execute? And so you can see here, it's actually giving me the help command. Like this is the interactive Python terminal. It's B Python Erwid. And it's such a better terminal. You can see it's actually giving me like the, the pi doc, doc strings of the actual function. So that's the driver command. Okay, so it's not a script. So what if I say execute script? And then it's a script synchronously executes JavaScript in the current one. So let's try this. Let's try alert works. Can we do that? Oh, it did. Look, it just ran the alert. So we can actually do all that stuff so I think we can do something like browser click too or like perform action so let's let's look around I'm was just kind of exploring there so we can get a page example one open a new browser load Yahoo search for selenium HQ and close the browser so what do we have to do here from selenium.webdriver.common.keys, import keys. And we've already got one over, so browser.getyahoo.com. Uh-oh, does it not like HTTPS? Does it? 
Does it not like Yahoo? Interesting. Let's see if it will let me get Google. No? Is it because I closed it? Did I close it? Let me try another one. Okay, now we've got another browser. Maybe that was the problem. So let me try again to get Yahoo. Okay, there we go. Yahoo. Assert Yahoo in browser title. Let's just print browser.title. Cool. Yahoo. Oh, that's it. That's all the title says. Yahoo. <laughs> Not even an exclamation point, just Yahoo. Element equals browser find element by name P. So we can say browser dot find element. Oh, look at all these. Find element by class name. Find element by CSS selector. Find element by ID. Find element by link text, by name, by partial link text, by tag name, and find elements, multiple. So let's say find elements by tag name. And the tag name there is like an A. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Look at all those. And so we'll say those are going to be the A's. Oh, uh, let me try it again. We'll say uh, the A. Is that a keyword? As? I guess that is a keyword. So we'll call it the links. <laughs> links. Yeah, there we go. So we can say for link in links. Oh, and another cool thing is it does the auto indentation for you in the in these interactive terminals. So then we can say link dot. Uh, what do we get? Let's just try and print link. Import p print what? Let's try this again. For links and links p print link. What? Oh, I think I had to press two enters. I forgot. You had to press enter twice to get out of the loop. Oh, so my problem there, okay. P uh, because I only imported the library, I have to do pprint.pprint, so I say the library and then the function name. Give it an extra blank line to finish it out. Oh, that is the pprint. It just says element, so I have to say, how do you get the element? Selenium element object. Oh, this is the Ruby docs, but I guess it's going to be similar. Attribute. Let's see, is there one? Text. Keys. Tag name. Text. I wonder if I do this on one line. Link dot. Oh, there we go. Now it's actually giving me all the info. Okay, so look, uh... It's a web element, so I could say text, probably right. There we go, so there's the text for all the links. It looks like there was an exception in one of them, but... Some of them probably didn't have a little text because they were images. Link href? No, so I, do I have to say get attribute? And then the name, so maybe the href, get the href of the links and print it. What happened? Did the browser die? I think I may have killed the browser again. Let me try and open another one. I'm not sure, did I close it by accident or did it crash? Oh, uh, maybe one of the, maybe when it ran into the exception, it crashed. No. So let me see here. I have I have a couple old cookbook examples. Let me see if I've got one to do that already. I think they're in Python. Selenium. So let me see if I can. 
open that directory in VS Code. And last night we did a stream on getting better at VS Code. And we looked around and did some customization and stuff. It was pretty fun. So, oh yeah, this is, okay, so this is how you save a screenshot. Dot save screenshot. So from here I should be able to just write, um, press F5. But I'm gonna have to install Selenium globally. Yeah, it's gonna say no Selenium. Yeah, so let me go ahead and do that. Let's say, get out of the virtual environment. Do it down here. Say pip install Selenium. I suppose... I'm not sure whether it defaults to Python 3 or Python 2. Which one did it use here? Python 3. Pip 3 installs Selenium. Now can I just press F5 and run it? Yeah, there we go. So this would be a little nicer than the interactive terminal. So here... Oh yeah, it's trying to save it to a directory that doesn't exist. Oh yeah, I'm in Vim mode. I'm using Vim mode in... Here, so I'm going to delete to the T. Insert home nano dano slash test PNG. Write it, and F5 to run it. So this is going to load Dev Dungeon, and it's going to save a screenshot, and then it's going to close the browser. So let me open my home directory. And it was in my home directory, right? Yeah, test.png. So there we go, there's a screenshot of the web page. And notice it didn't take a screenshot of the whole page all the way down to the bottom. It only took a screenshot of what it could see in its current viewport. So depending on the size of the browser. And I think you can take the whole screenshot if you want to. I think you can say, set the browser size to be that big. Okay. Let's see here. So we looked at installing the web driver. In that case, to install the web driver for this, all we had to do was go download the binary from GitHub. And that was... I actually want to take some notes here. So where was it? That was here. Installing the web driver. Let's just say, go to the releases page. That consisted of downloading the executable from there and putting the executable file echo driver in the box. Put the executable file, file in your path, and then you're good to go. I mean, that was it. That was actually very simple. And we looked at how to load a web page. That's the uh, browser.get. Take a screenshot. That was browser dot save screenshot, right? Let's pull that up. That was browser dot save underscore screenshot. Yeah. Headless versus visible, and it looks like I do have an example here already called headless dot pi. So let's check this out. Why is this unresolved import? Quick fix. Python, which Python are you using? Configure Python. I don't see, I don't use Python a lot in Visual Studio Code, and I'm not sure how to easily switch between. There we go. Python. Um, yeah, let's use that one. It should be able to find Selenium. Whatever. Uh, and Pi Virtual Display. Okay, so you need this additional module. Okay, so here you say display visible size 800, 600 display start. And then, yeah, so in this example, I had problems with Firefox trying to find the default binary. 
And so I had to import this specific driver called Firefox binary and explicitly tell it where the Firefox binary was. But otherwise you can just do it like this. See, these are two ways to get the driver. Hopefully it'll find the default stuff for you just like that. Otherwise you use Firefox binary. Okay. So all I'm doing here is the same thing, getting a screenshot. And so in this case we'll say headless screenshot. Okay. And th what this is going to do is it's going to run it and it's you're not going to see a browser at all because it's going to be running in headless mode. Now why is it complaining that it can't find... Oh, it's probably saying it can't find Pi Virtual Display, and that's okay, because we never installed that one. So we'll do pip3 install Pi Virtual Display. Now where did we... Where do we link up the display? Do we ever link? It's interesting. So like when you create this display, you don't have to tell the driver, hey driver, use this display. It just like kind of automatically hooks in under the hood. And then whenever the, the driver starts up, it will use that display. So that's interesting. It does a little bit of magic under the hood that you don't have to configure. So let's try running it again now. Same thing. Oh no, this is a, a legit error. Exception is command xvfb, no such file. xvfb? xvfb, what is that? X. Are those graphic drivers? Oh, X virtual frame buffer? Got it. X virtual frame buffer. So this is what's going to allow it to make make a butt like it's actually going to make a screen but it's going to make it hidden so hopefully now it can make the hidden buffer the hidden x window buffer that it needs to stop all right f5 to run it again in debug mode it looks like it's running it's running it's loading everything up in the background it should be taking the screenshot. It should take the screenshot and then exit by itself, but it looks like it's... It's paused? Continue? Hold on, yeah, something seems wrong there. Let's go back to... This one and press F5. No. What is this error now? Oh yeah, we're, we don't need all this complicated stuff. We just want the regular one. So let me swap out. Let's see. Comment that out. Comment. And oh, how do I get this to go away? Go away message. All right. So instead of this, let's try this. Let's say delete shift P. Actually, let's try this. Uh, I know they have. We learned this last night. Screencast mode. So you can actually see what kind of keys I'm pressing. Let me know if that's actually more distracting and not helpful. But here, yeah, so I'm gonna go to the beginning of the line, comment that out, and then do, but yeah, just, so I'll say, delete to parentheses, and then save. F5. Alright, it's running. It's not complaining yet. It should take a few seconds to load up the invisible frame buffer for the screen. Take the There it is. Take the screenshot. And now it's done. So let's use Nautilus to open up the home directory. And we should see headless screenshot. Here it is. And there it is. The 800 by 600 virtual screen. And you can see we actually got the mobile version, or I don't know about the mobile version, but the, the responsive version 
that has the hamburger menu because the screen was only 800 by 600. So, cool. It's a good way to test your responsiveness then. You want to make sure that, like, okay, let's say you're working on a mobile app and you're, you're messing with the UI and you want to make sure your responsiveness is good, you can have a script that will go load up the page in like 10 different screen resolutions and you can make sure that your menu is responding properly and everything still lines up and there's nothing wacky. So that's cool. I can see a lot of benefit for that in testing. It's good for a lot of things, bug bounty hunting and web scraping and stuff. So where, where else were we here? Take a screenshot, headless versus visible, and we'll say uh, use Pi virtual display. And so we looked at how to extract the links too. That was basically uh, browser.find. Let's try this again. So I'll do beep. Ooh, yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. I wanted to try out one last thing. Oh yeah, how to extract, so... What? Driver dot find elements. Yeah, there we go. Find elements, for example, by tag name. Okay, yeah, use driver, I'll say browser, dot find elements. Okay, so how about clicking, uh, yeah, how do you perform like an actual click action? So we looked at how to get the data, how to load URLs, get the URL you're on, take a screenshot, but how do we actually interact with the page and do a click or something? So back to their tutorial, setting up a Selenium WebDriver project. Let's see, Python, pip install selenium, that's what we did. Introduction to the Selenium WebDriver API, by example. So let's see, let's click on Python. So here's what they do, driver equals webdriver.firefox. Driver equals, so we are kind of interchanging the word driver and browser. So in my example, some of them say browser and some of them say driver. Browser.get, okay, get. I wonder if you can do a post as well. Let's see. So this one's not real. How about driver.post? No. How about driver request, make request? No. Let's see. They only provide a get? How about, let's see. Selenium Python post request. Excuse me, I'm taking a drink of water. Interesting, look at this. Short answer, no. It looks like these days there's one called Selenium Requests that lets you actually customize the request that's being made. That's interesting. That's interesting that that's not a feature that they support out of the box. Maybe they do. Let, let me get a little further in the docs. Uh, oh, okay, here we go. Here we go, look at this. Send keys. 
You can send keys. Okay, I'm gonna have to check out send keys. Fetching a page, hold on. Uh, selenium send keys. Oh, look at all these drivers they have. They've got Firefox, Chrome, IE, Opera, Phantom JS, Remote, Proxy, and I don't know about these other ones. Conventions used in the API, exceptions. Oh, this is all like a one, this is a one page document. So here we go on the left, let's see. WebDriver API, locating elements. We already looked how to find elements. WebDriver API, special keys. Utilities, touch actions. That's what I want. Firefox WebDriver. Okay, let's check out a couple of these sections. Special keys. Sets of special key codes. Okay, cool. So you, I see. So they have a special class that has a whole bunch of constants for special key presses. So if you want to try something like uh, press the arrow down to scroll down in the page, or there's probably a mouse wheel. I bet there's a mouse wheel in here somewhere. No? Maybe that just counts as a button down or something. No, I don't see the word wheel anywhere in the document. So, let's see. There's, yeah, enters. It's like if you want to mimic the enter or, or the escape or something, there's special constants to help you with that, so that's nice. You don't have to mess with any weird key codes. Desired capabilities. I don't know about that. How about the uh, clipboard? Can you manipulate the clipboard? Touch actions, here we go. The touch actions implementation, does that, does that include clicks? Okay, double tap, flick, these, this sounds more like mobile stuff. Release, tap and hold, scroll. So, I wonder if they just treat clicks as taps. So there's just one API for both clicks and taps. So let's see, click, element click intercepted, oh no look they actually have a function called click, actions dot click. And okay look at this, here's an example of action chains. Action chains are a way to automate low level interactions such as mouse movements, mouse button actions, key presses, and context menu interactions. Context menus are the right click menus. So you can even tell it to like right click, view source, double click, actions, okay so let's see. Here's an example. So you find an element like the nav, and then you find the buttons you want to click, and then you create an action chain, and you say move to element, click, and then perform. So I guess you chain them together, and then when you're all done, you say perform. Okay, here's where you can do a click. Clicks an element, click. Click and hold. Context click is a right click. Double click, drag and drop. Key down, key up. Okay, so this is how you release send keys. Okay, so this is action chains. I'm gonna get the permalink for that. And I'm gonna say, there we go. Action chains. Awesome, this is for action chains class. Allows click, double click, send keys, etc. Okay, awesome. Now what was this last one? Firefox web driver. Yeah, so this is the actual documentation for the class. 
of the actual Firefox web driver. And so we can see in here all the parameters. Firefox profile. That's cool because with Firefox you can have different profiles. And with the profiles, for example, one really practical use I see for that is having a proxy set up. You can set up a proxy to capture all of the HTTP requests for your testing. So you can say, all right, this one should load up the browser with the special profile that has special proxies set so that we can capture all of the traffic and review the traffic and make sure that it's doing everything we expect it to. Oh, look, there's the special option for proxy too. So that saves you a lot of trouble. You don't have to bother with the Firefox proxy. Well, I guess this is the Firefox proxy that you're setting up, so it gives you an easy way to do that. Options, none, log file. Okay, cool. Then there's an initialize. Yeah, that passes. This is the maps to everything you see here. Okay. Context sets the context that Selenium commands are running in. Is that like the session where it stores all the cookies? Install add on? Oh, interesting. You can actually tell it to install add ons. That'd be interesting if you create some kind of add-on that it interacts with. Quit. Firefox web driver options, add argument, set headless. Okay. Oh yeah, so how about the clipboard? Well, let's go through their, let's finish going through their little tutorial here. Selenium web driver API. Okay, yeah, driver get. Locating elements, we figured out how to do that already. Use driver dot find element by blank, by ID, by class name, by tag name. Yeah, so you just say driver dot find element. Oh no, that's actually oh that's not the Python one. That's why. Oh, interesting. So they actually have sh shortcuts now. Oh yeah, here we go. Or here, this is the one I was expecting the first one. The full function that says find element by tag name. But it looks like you can also use this more generic find element and then give it an option in there. There might be option there might be reasons to do it this way. If if you want to do like a loop, let's say you're looking for an element that something that says password but you want to look in a bunch of different elements. So you can have a list of places to look. Like let's say, let's look at the tag name. Let's look at the class name. Let's look at the ID. Let's look at the data attributes and you can loop through them um, instead of having to, it'd be more difficult if you had to do it hard coded by the function names there. Mr. KZ says, very powerful when using Selenium in a CI CD pipeline. Yeah. Yeah, we're look like, I think the the main use I hear of people using it is for testing purposes, is for application testing purposes. But I see a lot more, I see a lot of security use for it, like uh, doing testing, doing application testing, doing bug bounty hunting, penetration testing, because you can write browser extensions and those are kind of cool, but this allows you to really script it on another level. Okay, so these are just a bunch of different examples of how to get it. Here we go, filling in forms. Let's try the Python version. So here's the Python version, let me make this bigger. So this is the one we're looking at. Select driver Find element by tag name, select, okay, so we're looking for a select element, which is a drop-down menu. And then we're gonna get the options, it looks like, from the drop-down menu. So we say from, okay, from the drop-down menu that we found, inside of that, find elements by tag name, options. So we're looking for all the options inside of the drop-down select. And then we're gonna iterate through each option found in the drop-down menu. And then we're going to say value is, and then we're actually going to get the value of the option. 
and it looks like it's going to click on each one. I'm not sure why. That wouldn't really be much benefit if it just went through and clicked. Oh, well, it might be a multi-select. So there might be value in clicking each of the multi-selects. Yeah, okay, we've already seen how to enter text into text area with send keys. But what about other elements? You can toggle the state of checkboxes and you can click to set something like an option tag. Dealing with select isn't too bad. Yeah, that's uh, this is actually pretty nice. Okay, and what is this one? You'll find the first select element and then go through, go inside it. Okay. And um, then deselect all. Okay. And then you can find an element and just do a click on it. So the Python version is find element and then click. Dot click. Yeah, it is that easy. It's just doing a dot click. So you don't have to use the action chains. You can just do dot click. Moving between windows and frames. Oh, that's good to know. So, let me go to the Python version. Driver dot switch to window. That's a nice one. We'll say switching windows. Driver switch window and performing clicks. Or, we can say or use driver dot find element whichever find element it is and then do a dot click oh it's just that easy now what about this I'll, okay so that's how you switch windows I wonder if that's the same for tabs switch to window switch oh there we go frame frame to frame I wonder if the frames are the tabs. Switch to frame. Pop-up dialogs. Dot alert. Starting with Selenium 2, there is built-in support for handling pop-up dialog boxes. After you've triggered an action that opens a pop-up, you can access the alert with the following. Oh, wait a second. So this doesn't generate an alert. It captures an alert? Is that what's going on? There's built-in support for handling pop-up dialogues. After you've triggered an action that opens a pop-up... Oh! It's not an alert pop-up, it's actually like a pop-up window. I think. That's a little confusing. I, if I had a specific use case for that, I'd come back and check it out. Okay, so you can navigate forward and back. I already saw that. Cookies, yeah, we saw how you can just do... Well, you don't even have to do all this. You can just say, "Oh, that's not. It's not Python. That's why uh, Python version." Yeah. So in Python, it's just as simple as driver dot add cookie, or driver dot delete cookie, or delete all cookies. So if you need to inject a session cookie, or you want to read all the cookies and see if there's anything juicy, maybe automatically look for session IDs, you can do some fingerprinting based on the session token, or the the name of the session cookie it can give you insight to what language or what framework the website is using. And by adding cookies like sessions, you can sidejack someone's session, or you can fake you can fake your user agent. Yeah, change your user agent. Um, so they're not doing it by setting the headers. They're using a different method to set preference. Drag and drop, yeah, that's cool. JavaScript, yeah, no, no. Yeah, 
anything else interesting in here. No, doesn't look like it. Next steps. This chapter has simply been a high-level walkthrough of WebDriver and some of its capabilities. Once getting familiar with the Selenium WebDriver API, then you will want to learn how to build test suites for maintainability, extensibility, and reduced fragility. See, like, they, even the creators have, like, a, a focus on building tests and testing. But I see, I see a much more practical, like, day-to-day -day use for doing stuff. Like, for example, if you have to run security scans on an application, and every time you do it, you need to go reset a user password, that you have to, like, go into the web page and, like, manually go through and reset the user password and do all that. You could automate that whole step using a browser. So it's really good for things that don't have an, a nice API for you to use. But the fact that you can interact with the browser while it's open, so like you can open it up with Selenium, drive around, let's say on a website that you're, you're pen testing or, or bug bounty hunting. And, and drive around on the page yourself in the browser and then be like, oh, this page looks interesting. And then pop back into the code and just say like, Python, run my function called analyze page. And it'll do 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 analyze it. And maybe you can even modify the CSS and like add a big red border to interesting things. So you just be like, hey, Python, analyze page. And then in your browser, it just goes boop and things light up in red and show you like, hey, there's some query parameters over here you can mess with, or there's no CSERF token on this form, and just stuff like that. Okay, so what about the clipboard? Yeah, I wanted to see, can Selenium, can you copy and paste stuff to the clipboard? Selenium Basics. The Java one's okay, let's check that out. I just want to see if the browser supports that. No, it looks like you have to use the system. I guess there's no reason to use the browser to do any copy and pasting. Since the copying and pasting from the browser is just going to go into your system clipboard anyway. So there should be real easy libraries for Python. This one's 004, so maybe not use this one. But basically, the idea is the same. There's probably simple libraries that do this. Um, Piperclip, yeah, that's the one. 170, yeah, they're a little more confident in this version. So in this one, you can just say, yeah, Piperclip copy. So like, let's say you wanted to copy the text of an element to your, your clipboards and paste it somewhere else, then this, you know, it's easy as calling the functions copy and paste. So, no, clipboard not in Selenium. And the Selenium IDE is the last thing I've, I've not ever really checked out. So, Selenium IDE. Let's check this out. Uh, let's see. There's 659 stars. I'd expect a little more. Maybe it's new. Maybe it's relatively new. Selenium IDE. What looks like the oldest, the license file is usually the oldest file. Two years ago. I bet that was like the first commit. You can go check. I think you can check uh, history. Yeah, there's literally one commit. It was probably the first commit ever. Anyway, okay, so this is actually a browser extension. Selenium IDE is an IDE for Selenium tests. It is implemented as a Firefox extension and allows you to record, edit, and debug tests. So I guess it syncs up with your Selenium backend. It requires your permission to access your data for all websites, download files and read and modify the browser's history. 
Display notification, access tabs, access browser activity. Yeah, I expect it needs all that stuff. And now we've got a nice icon up in the top, so let's try going to a web page and clicking it. Welcome to Selenium IDE. Can I make you bigger? Kind of. Okay. Welcome to the Selenium IDE. What would you like to do? How about close? Okay, I'll give you another shot. Okay, record a new test, create a new project. Record a new test in a new project, let's try that. Project name, Dano's Awesome Selenium. Kyle says, can't wait for the Selenium Beyond Burp Suite video. <laughs> yeah, uh, so a little while back we were making an extension. I'm still working on it, but did a bug, a bug bounty hunting browser extension. And it, it basically does kind of what I was describing earlier, where whenever you visit a page that you're interested in, you pop open the add-on and it goes through and it looks for interesting things and tries to summarize things for you at a, at a, at a glance. Okay, before you can start recording, you must specify the base URL. Let's try the best website ever. Zombocom. Oh, okay, that's it. Okay, there's. It's like it's. It's waiting for me to record. Well. Which, 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 which one is it? I had it too big, probably. <laughs> Stop. Uh, didn't, didn't finish. Have you guys ever seen Idiocracy? Where the guy's name ends up being not sure. It's a good movie. <laughs> um, okay, so if I hit record, base URL, let's try a different one. Stack Overflow. Is it gonna pop open Stack Overflow for me? No, it's just like, hey, I'm ready to start recording, but. Is it going to open a browser for me? Or... Do I just need to go there myself? Or do I just start... Yeah, I don't get why I had to give it a base... URL if it didn't even... Use it. Okay, click, click. Let's do a couple clicks. How about a page down? Windows scroll too, so it does... We'll click on one. How about we fill out the form and say, leet, is there, is the keyword leet anywhere on the website? No. Oh wow, it does. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to show up anyway. There is. It, it, it's in the packet capture with Go. Somewhere there says, it's also useful if you want to create your own leet protocol that doesn't even use TCP IP. <laughs> I was poking fun at people who would want to do it for fun. Where did I put that? What? Uh, there we go. Custom layers. It's down at the very bottom for custom layers. Okay, I'm done recording. Let's see how this works. What did it record? It recorded open. Oh, it looks like we can modify them down here too. Click, click, run script, click, type, click, Okay. It's interesting how it did this too. Like, click on child X as opposed to click on the link that goes here. So yeah, you could maybe customize that. So run current test, run all tests, run it. Okay, so popped open a new browser. It should click around, click around on some pages. Oh look, it's turning green. And it's showing us it's running. It's running. Wait for the search. It's going to do the search soon. Wait for it. Is it... Did it get hung up? What happened? Did it actually record how long it takes? I think it's hung up or something. It's going kind of slow. Stop. 
stop, fail, retry. Is that must mean my website's broken, right? If my test failed. <laughs> it is kind of fun to watch it. Interesting, yeah. It is failing. Why is it failing? Let's just delete that step to try it again. That is kind of a weird step, the scroll to... Oh, it's searching, there it goes. Searching, clicking, clicking, scrolling, 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 scrolling. Oh no, YouTube, don't copyright, strike me. Okay, so that's kind of neat. It's kind of like iMacros. This is very similar to what iMacros used to do when it was free, but it actually looks better than iMacros in a lot of ways. So this is exactly like if you just needed to repeat a process over and over, like resetting a password, this would be a good way to do it. You don't have to mess with any of the Python code. You don't have to dig into the source and figure out what the class names are, the IDs are for each div that you want to interact with. You can just say, hey, record my clicks, record my clicks and replay my actions. So that's a pretty cool browser extension. I can start, I can see uses for this immediately, for both of these. Before all I'd really used it for was grabbing a screenshot, and I knew you could do clicks and stuff, but I never explored it much deeper than that. It's good for scraping too, obviously, because you can actually click through pages and scrape and follow links and keep going. It's going to be a little slower since it's actually using the browser, but the benefit is it is a real browser and you're not going to have any of the weird JavaScript problems. So if you're just using something like the requests library and beautiful soup, then you're going to have problems on things like single page applications written in Angular or React or Vue or are very heavily JavaScript based and Ajax based because beautiful soup and requests aren't going to like actually parse and execute that JavaScript to update the page properly. But Firefox, when you're actually driving Firefox, it's actually going to handle it exactly as it would if you did it yourself, because it is the same driver, technically. Cool. So, that's everything I really wanted to cover. I know I didn't dive too much into the code, but... I'll leave that as an exercise to you to actually maybe try and do more things with it. I really wanted to kind of look at it as a whole, see what it's capable of, make sure we can figure out how to get it to run. And now that we've got that whole framework of the puzzle, all the outside pieces of the puzzle, now you can start exploring the API and task by task, whenever you need to do something specific, figure out how to achieve that goal. So the last thing I'm going to do before I sign off here is update. I just want to maybe put some of these notes in my cookbook. So I should have this open already. So yeah, I've got a Selenium notes thing here. Let me just drop this in. So what do I want to make notes about? Yeah, installing the driver. I don't need to do that. Now this isn't going to be the best formatted thing. I really just wanted to make sure I jotted these notes down and put them in my cookbook. That way if I ever need to come back and refer to them these are the most common tasks I could ever uh, picture myself doing, so 
let's up, let's clean this up a little bit. Let's rename it to a readme.rst, and we're gonna call this Selenium Notes. Install. We'll say forehead list display. Well, let's see. Install using pip. Let's actually make let's actually make this formatted nicely. Pip install selenium, and then we'll say for headless display, also include pi virtual display. And that is pip install pi virtual display. And then Chrome Web Driver. Yeah, let's so let's say uh, install the necessary web drivers. Actually, this isn't going to be code. Okay, so this is going to be the Firefox one. Uh oh. So I'm using the Vim mode extension now on. Visual Studio Code, and I'm getting used to it. But the other night we did a stream on getting better at Vim, and I had a huge level up in my Vim confidence. It's been years since I sat down and like looked at the commands and took time to learn new ones and commit it to memory and refresh things. So I'm trying to kind of reinforce the knowledge and I'm using VI mode in my shells. I don't know if I showed I showed the other night how to do this, but you can say set o set dash o vi in your shell. This works in bash and z shell. And then you've got oh, and I wanted to show you this too. So check this out. You can go. Um, I think there's one called Avit that does it. Uh, but then you also got to install the uh, VI mode. So I'm using Z shell. And now so I'm in I'm in VI mode and if you hit escape or you go or you hit the uh, control bracket, then you go into command mode and with the right Z shell extension you can tell when you're in command mode here. And then you can actually do things like delete to the end, you know, delete word, delete to the end. And so you, you can go back and forth and you've got both modes, so it's really nice. And it's really easy to switch to because by default you're in insert mode. And so if you switch it, you really don't notice any difference until you actually need a reason to hit escape and go into command mode. And then you do whatever you need to do in command mode. But another cool thing is once you're in, if you're using the Vim mode, then when you're working on a command like this, let's say you've got a real complicated command and you need a reference or you need to make a big, long, multi-line comment, you can pop it open in Vim in a temporary buffer. You can see down here, it just loaded up a temporary file. And then in here, we can say like, oh, hold on, okay, let me make a, let me make this line longer. And okay, let's add another one. Oh, shoot, hold on, I forgot. Let me pull up the help for the file. So now you say, uh, command mode, you do colon, and I think you do bang. And then the file you need, so like, I don't know, let's try ls dash dash help. Okay, like, okay, cool. Um, I needed to check out the flags and the help information real quick. And then you go back into your editor. And once you're all done, you just say right quit and it writes it to the temporary buffer and it drops it back in your shell. So you can pop hop into Vim and also like if you need to do it again, go back into it and even, you know, split your editor and then go in here and like open up a different file I guess it's the same buffer BLS yeah anyway learned some cool Vim stuff the other day for sure but I forgot I forgot what even brought me there I was just showing off some Vim stuff oh yeah and if you want to get back so default you're in Emacs mode or not O, is it? No, it's OVI. Set uh, OVI and set O Emacs.
Okay, so, yeah, I was updating this here. So, Chrome Web Driver, here we got Firefox Web Driver. Yep. Okay, so now I can clean up this, I don't need those lines. useful functions, some of that. Take a screenshot of a page. How about this? We'll make them subheadings. Now I'm going to show you guys a little bit of restructured text stuff. So I'm going to show you how it takes the headings and it'll generate a nice table of contents for you at the beginning automatically. And I'll try and keep this text at the top so my display mode doesn't get in the way. Then headless mode. Use Pi Virtual Display. And initialize. And just initialize before creating the driver. Extract all links from a page. So yeah, this is just wrapping up and kind of documenting the stuff I found out and everything, so... This is an important step, documenting your stuff, and look at, I don't know if you would agree that this looks nicer than what we had a second ago, but in a second I'll show you how this converts to HTML automatically in GitHub. GitHub is automatically going to convert this for us, and we'll see how nice it looks in a browser in a minute. And restructured text has more features than Markdown, which is why I like it. And I'll show you one of my favorite ones, and it's just this, watch. Contents. Boom. There's a directive here that will that'll automatically parse all of the headings and create a table of contents with links to each section for you. And that alone is like one of the best features. Okay, so performing a click, refer to the action chains dots action chains class allows you to click blah 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 let's see delete ah, I forget what mode I'm in sometimes okay and the last piece or say or use dot click Switching windows, one last section. Okay, that's gonna, oops. We'll just say switch windows and frames tabs. Actually still not sure, like this. And then I'm gonna move, ah, no, undo. Whoa. Redo? No, I think I undid too many changes there. Redo? What happened?
Look at it. It's typing. It's doing everything itself. I think I did like uh, a 25 undo by accident in Vim. Wait, now it's going the other way. Now it's regressing again. <laughs> okay, this is enough. This is close enough. Switching windows. And... Okay, switch windows or frames, which are tabs, like this. Oh. Okay. Now this, I want to move up here somewhere. Useful functions here. Selenium ID is a browser extension that allows you to record and replay actions. Okay. I think that's all I'm gonna do. That looks fine. Okay. So let me go... Oh yeah, there's a version control. There's a nice version control thing here. What I realized yesterday is that not only does it show you the changes, so we've got some U, which means some untracked files, and cookbooks. So like this one, I want to revert that one. This one, I actually want to... Uh, I guess if I discard changes, will it just delete it? Because I don't even... Yeah, are you sure you want to delete the file? Yeah. Don't even want it. Uh, markdown was changed to RST. Yes, I want to... Stage that one, so add that one. I want to add that delete as well. Basic example. Hold on, what did I change? Oh, I changed the name. Now I'm just going to revert those changes to the log. Yeah, I don't care. I'm going to discard that. The headless one, I'm going to go ahead and save that one. And these two files, I'm not ready to commit yet. So here I'm just going to say adding selenium notes and then I guess I just hit commit enter no enter will break lines okay so control enter boom now I've committed my changes so if we go to the github.com slash dev dungeon slash cookbook slash python slash selenium examples wait a second oh I didn't I didn't push that's why so to push using the GUI, we go down here to the bottom left, where we've got here, and we can see that uh, zero down means there's nothing we need to pull down, but there's one up, which means we have one change that we need to push up. So let's click it, and it says this action will push and pull commits. Say, okay, that's fine. I want you to push and pull. It should just take a second. No. Okay, so now it looks like we're all in sync. So if I go back here and I refresh, there we go. Now check out this nice readme.rst. And we've got our contents here. And it links to each one of these little sections. And we even have permalinks if we want to jump right to one. And we've got a nice summarized table of contents. And we've got all the syntax highlighting and the code uh, monospacing. The bullet points, the headers, the breaks, the subheadings, all that good stuff. And GitHub does all that for us from our text our text file here. And I do have a whole stream on using restructured text to write docs using read the docs. Readthedocs.org is a really cool site. And I also have a tutorial on using restructured text that is really in-depth that goes into a lot of details there. And the last things I'm gonna plug are the Discord server. If you're not already on Discord, go to devdungeon.com and click join me on Discord in the right column and come hang out and chat. Also, right below that is a link to my book, Security with Go. Check out the other tutorials on the blog. 
Also subscribe to the YouTube channel for the daily live streams. Check out Dev Dungeon on GitHub. It's github.com slash devdungeon for code and all of the good stuff we do here. There's tons of good stuff there. And I think that's it. So I appreciate everybody who came out. It was good chatting. And I hope everybody learned something. And I hope that we see you guys again. I'm going to sign off and I'll see you tomorrow.